Namaste and welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu, 40 verses on reality. So to distinguish reality from illusion means to distinguish non-duality from duality. So today we're going to look at one of those dualities, how it arises and how it resolves in realization. The dispute as to which prevails, fate or free will, is only for those who do not have correct knowledge of the root of fate and free will. That is, this dispute arises only for those who do not know that the ego, who is the experiencer of fate, and the wielder of free will is truly non-existent. Those who have known the non-existence of the individual self, the ego, who is the one and only base of fate and free will, have discarded them. That is, they have discarded fate and free will along with their root and base, the ego. Say, will they again become entangled in fate and free will, or in the dispute about them? Ain't lightly, McGee. <laughs> Why? Because the root of duality is separation, distinction, boundaries, and self. Brahman, or non-dual consciousness, non-dual awareness, without an object, has no boundaries. That's not to say that it's all one, but it's non-dual. You see, we are conditioned or programmed with beliefs shaped by our language, our logic, our body, the nature of our minds, and so on. And one of those beliefs is that everything has an opposite. So if there is such a thing as fate, there must be something like free will, and vice versa also. But what does it really mean? Fate means things that happen that we can't control. And free will means things that we can control. So, on the level of uh, the existence of the body and mind, and ego, there are some things we can control and some things we can't. There's even a saying about it, something like, Lord, give me the intelligence to distinguish between what I can and can't control. Huh? <laughs> oh yeah, the intelligence to know the difference. <laughs> because why should you knock your head up against a wall trying to influence or manage something that is out of your control? It's a waste of time and effort. So the truly wise person doesn't really see a difference. Uh, the sage, the self-realized person, doesn't see a difference. Because why? The measure of whether something is fate or free will is based on the ego. If I, the ego, can control it, it's free will. And if I can't control it, it's fate. But if the ego doesn't exist, then where is the distinction? Stuff happens, that's all. Whether I control it or not doesn't really make much of a difference in the end. Let's go back again to <laughs> good old Mulapariyaya. Huh? Mulapariyaya, the root sequence, says that for every perception, every experience, we create, conceive, or inject the thought I 
and mine into it. And since many, many perceptions are coming every second, this creates the illusion of a continuous existence of I, just exactly in the same way as a continuous succession of movie frames creates the existence of a persisting character on the screen. So because of this, we ourselves create by our own effort with the mind this illusion of I, the ego, the separate self, the individual. So when we see this, we stop. Why? <laughs> because it's embarrassing. Huh? It's stupid. <laughs> it's like here come all of these uh, items down a conveyor belt and we have this big stamp that says I, boom, I, boom, I, boom, I, boom. We've become a machine. We have become a habit-driven ego monster, simply stamping events and perceptions with our little red stamp of I. So what is the, con what is the meaning of free will? If we have to be a robot to create this I that experiences it or that claims it, now, on the other hand, <laughs> karma is coming. Every body, I mean literally every body, is born with certain karma called prarabdha karma. Prarabdha means ripe. It's ready to manifest. And as the planets and moon go around like the hands of a big clock, uh -huh, They'll tick off certain aspects and boom, karma will happen. It's out of our control. It's fate, destiny, what have you. Especially the big things in life. How and in what circumstances one is born, what kind of parents one has, the situation around one at birth, economically, politically, socially, and so on. Obviously, these are out of our control. Huh? Some people say it's like a gigantic lottery. <laughs> but it's more than that. It's personalized. And it's based on our actions, our free will choices in a previous life. Of course, we don't have access to that information, at least in the default consciousness. So we don't know exactly what we did to deserve what we got. But there is no injustice in this universe. If someone comes into a bad situation, it's because they deserve it. Or vice versa, if they come into a good situation. I, I used to do a bit of astrology, Jyotish, not ordinary astrology, Vedic astrology. And it's very easy to get a sense of what a person has done in their past lives within two minutes of casting their chart. How? by looking at their yogas, in particularly the Raja Yogas. Raja Yogas are those yogas that give you the opulences of a king. And so if someone has acted piously in past lives, they get a lot of Raja Yogas. I've seen up to, in fact, my Adi Guru had like 16 of them, 16 Raja Yogas in his chart. So uh, he was literally a great king, Maharaj. Most people have, well, most people in developed countries, Western countries, have six, seven, eight, maybe, Raja Yogas. And people in difficult situations in life will have, you know, one or two. This is really obvious from the astrology. So if it can be read in an astrological chart, then it means the cause is outside this life, previous to this life, and comes into manifestation at birth. 
So then from that you can go and extrapolate a person's whole life. And in many cases, the person's whole life will be very predictable based on those initial indications. However, this is a really interesting point. The more sadhana a person does, the more spiritual growth a person attains within their life, you ask any astrologer, the harder it is to predict what's going to happen simply by astrology. There are other ways to predict. Astrology will not give you, in fact, the astrology chart becomes more and more irrelevant until at the point where a person attains complete enlightenment, it's practically meaningless. What does that mean? They're running on pure free will. They have transcended their chart. How does that work? Well, again, the Buddha comes to our rescue. And he described it like this. Someone asked, well, how is it that when you become enlightened, your karma ceases to act on you? And he described it like this. Suppose you have a hut. And in the wall of a hut, there's a window. And the sun is just coming up. And the rays of the sun are coming in through the window. Where do they fall? And so the questioner said, well, on the wall the opposite wall. Buddha says, right. Now, what if I take out that wall? Then where do they fall? The questioner says, well, I guess in that case they would fall on the ground. Buddha says, very good. But what if we take out the ground? <laughs> then where do they fall? And the guy says, well, I guess they would fall on the ocean. And finally, the Buddha says, and what if we remove the ocean? Where do they land? Mm. <laughs> the questioner had to say, well, I guess they don't land. They don't land. They don't have any place to, to land. So this is the situation with karma. The, the analogy used by the Buddha has a certain meaning. The wall, of course, represents the ego the individuality, saying, I am different from that. Huh? And the ground represents the body, the body-mind, which is the basis or, or foundation of the ego. So if we take that away, then what's left? The ocean. Well, the ocean is the consciousness. Water is an ancient symbol for consciousness. And if we take that away, too, no place for it to land. It's just like when you send a letter through the mail to a non-existent address, it comes back stamped undeliverable. Huh? Cannot deliver. No addressee. Oh, that's another one. <laughs> or no address, no such address. Sorry, can't deliver. So in the same way, the karma that's due to... Uh, very enlightened person has no address. So how can it be delivered? But really, see, the essence of this is a very recondite point. That when one transcends duality, when one uh, realizes the non-dual consciousness of the self, Brahman, then duality simply ceases. And it's not that one becomes one with everything. That's such a puerile misunderstanding. No, there is no number. Not one, not none, not three, not 17. There is no number. And certainly not two. But the duality that's built into our conditioned consciousness comes from our binary logic, true, false, black, white, up, down, in, out, free will or destiny. And when the ego is seen to be illusory, this happens in, in Buddhist 
meditation at the third path. In fact, this is third path realization that one sees that not only is the ego illusory, it was always illusory. It never really existed. Consequently, ignorance, conditioning, dualistic logic, delusion, egotism, desire, like loving, hating, wanting, owning, uh, being the cause or being the effect or any number of dualities not only do not exist, they never existed. They're not only illusory now, they were always illusory and only the reality, only the non-dual, boundaryless, unconditioned, uh, objectless awareness ever exists. Om Tat Sat. <laughs> Om Hari Om.